Okay, so we'll make a start. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Gavin Newlands. I'm part of the development team who works on Oasis Primer. And today I'm going to be talking about version 15 of Primer, which is our upcoming uh, new release. Now, just a little bit about the versions and where we are. Um, so the current full release is version 14.1, which was released in August of last year. Um, and version 15 will be released very shortly indeed, um, uh, in a few days, hopefully. Now, in terms of LSDynar keyword support, um, Primer 15 will support everything up to and including R10 of the LSDynar keyword manual. So that's across volumes 1, 2, and 3. And also some development R11 keywords and fields are supported as well. So I'm just going to go through some of the new features that you'll find in version 15. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, some tools to help new users or maybe um, some experienced users find some features that they didn't know was in Primer. So the first thing to talk about is Quick Find. So Quick Find is something that we've added in. Um, that allows you to um, search for and quickly find menus and functionality in Primer. Also allows you to open specific entity panels quite quickly. It allows you to do other things like blank, unblank, and only include files. And it allows you to open specific pages in the LSDynar keyword manual as well. So you access this by using a magnifying glass button that's available in Primer, or you can use the hash shortcut key as well. Now I'm just going to demo this. So a lot of my demos are interactive. So if I just bring up Primer, you should be able to see Primer open now. And um, quick finds can be found here. So this is the magnifying glass. So if I click on that, and I'll get a box that I can type something in. So let's just type something in. If I type in mass, you can see I now get a list of tools that are available in Primer and um, which have mass in the title. So the top one here is mass properties. If, it, if I click enter, it brings up the mass properties panel. And I can now um, uh, use that use that tool. Um, I can search for other things as well. So let's search for... Um, let's say I wanted to look for measure part to part. So I could type in measure part to part, but this uses fuzzy logic. Um, so I don't have to type in the full text strings. So if I type in MPTP, or measure part to part, you can see it's found all the matches in the model there that, that, that match that text string that I've typed in. So measure part to part is top, but below that is measure point to point. And there's also some, some uh, parts as well. So I can click on measure part to part, and I'm taking straight to it. Now, you might not know in Primer that um, the, it's called measure part to part. So you can also type in alternative text as well. So let's say I typed in um, distance between parts. And hopefully you can see I haven't typed in the full string distance between parts. I've just typed in dist bet par. And it's found, again, measure part to part. So I can access it there as well. Now, I said you can access um, uh, model data as well. So that was looking at um, functionality, finding functionality. But if I type in uh, LM, LM shell K, so LM shell K, hit enter, it'll open up the keyword editor for element shells. So you can access model data as well quite quickly. Also, you can access the keyword manual. So if I wanted to open up the keyword manual for boundary prescribed motion, um, so I've typed in B P R M O man for boundary prescribed motion manual, hit enter, and it opens up the LSDNA keyword manual at the correct page for what you typed in. A 
Again, accessing data, you can access data by the names of items. So let's say I wanted to look up um, uh, the roof part. So I've typed in roof here. You can see there's lots of different parts in this model with roof in the title, but the main one at the top here, click on that. I get the edit panel for the roof part. If I sketch that, you can see that that's now the, um, that's the part that I'm looking for. You can create entities through here. So if I type in create part, hit enter, opens up the creation panel for parts. And you can also do only on um, certain include files. So if I type in inkle IP, it'll do an only on the IP in this model. So there's lots of different functionality built into this, and hopefully it makes it easier for you to find functions in Primer, um, but also investigate model data quicker. Now this search algorithm has also been added into the preferences editor. So if your uh, preferences are the settings that um, persist across different Primer sessions, so you get to that front through the options edit preferences in Primer, and you can change different preferences in there. There's quite a few preferences though. Um, so we've now added in this, uh, this this same fuzzy logic search to to find those. And also you can you will find quick find um, uh, functionality in both D3 plot and This as well in version 15. Also in the help uh, menu, you'll also find quite a few new tutorials. So under the tutorial section, you can click on any of these tutorials and it will open up a PDF that will go through the um, uh, tutorial for uh, lots of different functionality in Primer. Okay, I'll move on to creating um, or modifying your model. So tools that allow you to modify your model. First thing I'll talk about is morphing. So in previous releases of Primer, you could use um, Orient plus Interpolate to, to morph mesh. In version 15, we've added a new interactive tool um, to allow you to morph mesh as well. So the way this works is you can create a bounding box around mesh, and then you can interactively change the size and shape of the box, which in turn changes the size and shape of the mesh within the box. So I'll just demo this. So here I've got a, a model, and I'm going to try and morph this fuel tank here. Now I'll try not to rotate the model too much because I know it must be a little bit jerky on your end. So if I go to Mesh Tools and Morph, first of all I want to create a box around the mesh that I want to um, uh, morph. So I'll just click the parts in the fuel tank here. Now that's created a box. I now have some drag handles on that box, on the corners, and on the edge points, and also on the face points. And I can click on these and move them around. Now by default, um, the left mouse button will move in global X, the middle mouse button will move in global Y, and the right mouse button will move in global Z. So if I just click on this point here, hopefully you can see, it might be a little bit jerky for you on the other end of the line, but hopefully you can see and changing the size and shape of the box, I can change the, the mesh inside as well. Now there are different options for how to move these control points. Um, there's a free mode where it just moves in the plane of the screen, or you can move in just the X, the Y or Z coordinate system. Um, by default, it's in the uh, global coordinate system, but you can switch to a local coordinate system as well. And there's also options for selecting multiple drag handles and moving them at the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, these morph boxes, when you create them, um, when you write your model out, they will be stored um, after star end in the model that you write out. Um, so we often store things after star end, and that means when you read the model back into Primer, these these tools will be available to you. So if you create a morph box and write it out, 
when you read your model back into Primer, the morph box will be there and you can you can use it again. So this one over here, see I've got another box on the tunnel of this vehicle model. And this is one that was read in with uh, with this model. And I can click on these uh, morph box, uh, the drag handles and change the size and shape of the mesh within these boxes. And this is this is certainly something that we um, will continue to um, add to and modify over future releases as well. Moving on to talk about mechanisms. So mechanisms, if you're not familiar with mechanisms in Primer, it's a tool that allows you to define um, linkages between assemblies within a model. Um, and then once the linkages are defined, you can use Primer to move the assemblies around relative to each other. And the classic example is, is, is a seat model where you have lots of different linkages that you want to move around but still maintain the connections between all the different parts. And you want to move a seat to lots of different positions and the seat back moved to the correct location and all these linkages down here uh, to move correctly as well. So for a number of versions now in Primer, you've been able to set up these mechanisms. So we made a few changes in version 15. One is we've added the ability to read more answer comments to convert answer kinetic ent entities into Primer mechanisms. And the other thing we've added in is a new connection type called coupler, which allows you to impose a linear equation which links together mechanism connections. This is best shown in an example. So I'm just going to go into Primer again. So here we have um, a very simple model where we have two gears. And you can see we have a green gear and a blue gear. If I go to Mechanism and go to Position, I'm going to drag an assembly. So I'm going to drag this blue gear. As I drag it round, hopefully you can see that the green gear is rotating the appropriate amount according to the rotation of the, the blue gear. And that's because I've set up a coupler in this model that knows the relative um, uh, diameters of these two gears. Now you can also do the th same thing when looking at something like this, where you want to change a, a rotation into a translation. So let me show you in this one, mechanism, position. Drag assemblies. So I'm going to drag the, the green gear here, and you can see the top blue part is moving. And again, because the coupler knows the relationship between the radius and how much this should move, then the movement is as you'd expect. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, swage or bead creation now. So in version 15, we've added a tool that allows you to create stiffening swages and beads in shell meshes. So as you'll know, Primer is not a full meshing package, but we try to add in um, tools that allow you to make small meshing changes without having to write your model out and, and, and read it in elsewhere. So I'll, I'll demo this one as well. So here, I've got another model, which is just a, a floor, a few floor panels from a vehicle model. And let's say I wanted to add a stiffening swage down here. If I go to Mesh Tools, Swage, um, I get a panel where I have lots of inputs and I can specify the size and shape of this swage. So I'm just going to um, type in a height value. And I'm just going to start clicking on here to define the path and the swage. So I get a I get a, um, a sketch representation of what the swage will look like. And I just click apply to create it in the mesh. And I can create another one over here if I want. So let's create one up here. Apply to create it. I can also undo these as well. So if I click on undo, 
you get back to your original mesh before. Okay, so hopefully that makes it easier for you to add these sort of things in. There's been a few other meshing tools updates as well. So we've generally improved the internal meshing engine, which is used by a variety of tools within Primer. So uh, it's used by mesh hole creation or removal. Um, remesh area is used by that. And it's also used by the heat affected zone creation um, for spot welds that was introduced in version 14 of Primer. Where for um, uh, when creating spot welds, you locally remesh around that spot weld and create heat affected zones around it. We've also added in a new tool to create beams along selected nodes. So sometimes you might want to create beams along edges like this, maybe for contact reasons. And um, there's a tool to allow you to easily do that as well. So I'll talk a little bit about composites now. Um, so for a few versions now, Primer has contained tools for creating, managing, and modifying composite data in an LS Dyna model. And the reason you um, want to have tools like this is it can be a little bit tricky to set up um, uh, composite model data in LS Dyna. And one of the main reasons for that is if you have a situation like this, where you have a layup with uh, many different plies, and let's say this is one shell on the left-hand side, then you've got a shell in the middle, and you've got a shell on the right-hand side. Now, for the shell on the left-hand side, you can see the top pink ply. Um, that would represent integration point one. So you'd have a material, a thickness, and a beta angle for integration point one here. But for its neighboring shell, the middle shell, you can see that, that ply is actually integration point two. And so you'd have the same material thickness and beta angle, but this time on the integration point two. And then for the third shell, that ply is not in there at all. So there's tools for allowing you to easily manage um, and create this information. You can read a layup file in Primer and it can get converted into um, LS Dyna data. And then you can modify the ply order, extend them, delete them, and so on. And Primer will automatically update all the integration point data on the element shell composite cards. Now, in version 15, these tools have been improved. And one thing to note is the ability to set orientation angles of the composite fibers. And I'll just show you this in a demo again. So here we have um, a very simple model. It's just one part, and it's a composite seat. So if I go up to Tools, Composite, I have one layup here. And this is the tools I was talking about, where I've got 11 plies, and you can modify the information in this panel. And if I click through these plies, you might not be able to see this on your screen, but I'll zoom in a little bit. And you can see that we're sketching the shells that have got um, information related to this ply in their integration point data. And it also sketches the beta angles. So one thing I wanted to show here is this new orient button, which allows you to interactively set the beta angles um, for the various plies. So if I take this one shown here, you can hopefully see um, the fibers running from left to right. Um, there's various options here, but if I show you the map fibers option, uh, apply it to ply six in this model. Um, and I, I can either choose free edges or I can draw map lines to specify the direction of the beta angle. So I'm going to draw some map lines. So if I click here, I can just draw some arrows. And then that's me specifying direction. I can just click apply and Primer will orient the beta angles for that particular ply. So that particular integration point information on those shells changes the beta angles to match that direction. Now I can do, you know, I can draw whatever I want here. So if I draw some more map lines here, do some sort of curve, click apply, and again, 
um, the beta angles are changed to match that. Now, if I do something a bit silly like this and have those lines crossing each other and click apply, primer will do its best, but you can see that now some of these shells are highlighted yellow. And that means that neighboring shells have got very different beta angles for those integration points. So it's pointing out that there might be a potential problem in your model. As I said, there's a few different options here, as well as map fibers. You can use vectors to specify directions. Um, you can rotate fibers um, just by typing in a particular um, amount that you want to rotate all fibers by and so on. Now, if you don't work with composites, but want to use these same tools with just the normal element shell beta flag, you can also access that through element shell. And if you click on the option button here on the right hand side, that will give you access to um, the beta that you can turn on and use the same um, um, functions for mapping the beta angles down there as well. So moving on to scripting. Um, so, so scripting continues to be an important and popular functionality within our software, both in Primer and in D3Plot and THIS. Um, and so many people are using scripting to extend the capabilities of um, the Oasis software and also add their own functionality in there. And we're continuously adding more functionality to the JavaScript APIs to allow you to create your own tools. Now, I'll not go through all of these, but there's been quite a few new updates in there. We've added uh, functionality to read CSV files easily, uh, control the font size on widgets and that sort of thing. So there's quite a few new features in there. And we've also added the ability to automatically run a script prior to key out. Um, so that might, uh, people have requested this so they can ask certain questions when you're writing a model out. Have you done this? Have you added comments here? And so on. Moving on to pedestrian protection. Um, so we've got various tools in Primer relating to pedestrian protection. Um, the main one really is the pedestrian markup script, and that allows you to um, uh, mark up your vehicle according to particular regulations and also then specify impact um, grid points within those zones that are being calculated and then automatically position uh, your head form at all those different points and write out all the models. So um, the C Chinese NCAP 2018 protocol has been added in there and that uses a plate method for finding the corner of the bumper which the global technical regulation also uses. Um, so that's been added in there as well. We've improved the wraparound line calculations um, when looking at uh, grills like this. Sometimes um, we had issues where these wraparound lines would fall into these grill, grill holes, but we've improved that in version 15. And also you can now write out all the markup information into a separate model. And you can use those uh, when making design changes if you want. So here we have the stick being rubbed along the edge of the vehicle to uh, calculate the bonnet side reference line or the sphere being rolled along the back to calculate the bonnet rear reference line, all that sort of stuff, wraparound lines as well. So you can write all that out as a separate model. Now, this was something that we added into version 14. So I talked about this last year. Um, and this is a HIC area uh, tool. So what happens here is you read in a CSV file of data. So it's XYZ coordinates and HIC value. And Primer will give you a contour plot of um, HIC values. So you get something that looks like this. And it will calculate the area. So it will calculate for this outer boundary, this whole area what the green area is, for example. <laughs> and there's various things you can do in this tool. So there's a sensitivity study um, option here where you can get a plot that looks something like this down the bottom left. What this is saying is if I were to change the HIC values uh, or reduce the HIC values by a certain amount, all the different points, um, 
which which of the points would give me the biggest effect on um, increasing the green area. So you can see down here, it's pointing towards this highlighted area as the area you might want to consider looking at first if you want to reduce Hick values and optimize the area which is green. So we've added a few things to this for version 15. One is we've added in um, the new Euro NCAT version 8 grid method score calculation. So that's been added in there. Um, we've also added in the ability to click on any of the individual points that you read in and change its value to something else. So you might want to click on a point and see how uh, a value has changed. If a value went from 800 to 700, what effect would that have on the area? And also we've added in the ability to turn on band sensitivity. So this will highlight um, any points that are close to ch changing banding. So changing from green to orange or orange to green or yellow to orange or so on. Um, just one thing to note about decomposition. So decomposition is, is obviously quite important when you're running across MPP and you want to optimize that. Um, so being able to visualize how your model is being decomposed is, is, is a useful thing to be able to do. Um, so there's a new script. So if, uh, we give out scripts with primer that do various things. So if you go to tools, scripts, you'll be able to find this in version 15. And this is a new script that allows you to easily see how your model is split up. So if you have the control MPP decomposition decomp out control card on, when you run that model in LS Diner, it will produce a decomp parts.ses file, which is an animator session file. Um, Primer can now read this and then display all the different, um, uh, as different colors, the elements, that are, how they're being decomposed in your model. So moving on to occupants now. Um, so if you use Primer for occupant um, um, positioning and setting up occupant analysis, you'll know about the tools that are in there. Um, but in terms of <coughs> um, occupant position and seat squash, so Primer contains functionality to set up simulation-based occupant position and seat squash separately. Um, so that's been there for a number of versions and is, is very much the norm now for or when you're positioning your occupant or you're squashing your occupant into your seat, you're in a simulation-based positioning or seat squash. So in version 15, we've added new functionality um, that allows you to combine these into one analysis. So you can position your occupant and um, squash it into the seat at the same time. So I'll just demo this. can find the right model here we go so here I have a model <coughs> which has got a seat and an occupant model in its kind of standard stock position and I want to set up an analysis that will position the occupant into the seat and also squash the seat at the same time so under safety I can go to dummy and seat squash which is a new option and you get a floating panel which allows you to set this up. Now there's various different options here. There's um, you can just you can do a dummy into a seat, or you can just do a dummy. Um, cable type. This is uh, there's a new displacement-based cables. Previously we were using force-based cables. Displacement-based ca based cables basically allow you to have more control over how the um, cable um, is reeled in over a set period of time. And then I can I do two stage or one stage positioning. Now I've got a slide in a minute that explains two stage or one stage, but at the minute I'll set up two stage. And basically it guides you through a series of steps where you select certain things in your model to set up this analysis. So this is going through the seat squash setup, asking me which components make up the seat. So I can choose the seat include file. Um, what's the dummy? Select the dummy. Select the contact between the seat and the dummy. And now I'm going through the process of specifying certain things with the, the dummy model so I can um, uh, set up 
uh, simulation-based dummy positioning. And this has all been set up previously, so I'll go through this. I can specify the duration of my stages. They can't finish. That's setting up certain things in the models. Now I want to specify my target positions. Okay. So first of all, I'll set the H point. Uh, two, four, five, zero. Three, two, five. So that's my H point, and I'm going to rotate the whole thing. And I'm going to move the arms and legs into an upper position as well. So I might be moving the hands onto the steering wheel, for example. Let's move it up here a little bit. Do the other one. Um, something like that. And I'll just move the, let's say I move the feet into a particular position on pedals or something like that. So let's say I'm happy with that position. I then in this panel click on add position and it adds it into the list. And all, then I can continue setting up other positions as well. So let's say I wanted the hands in a slightly different position. So let's move them up a bit click on add position and I can flick between these two positions in the list here and you can add as many positions into this list as you want and Primer will create a new model for each of the positions. Okay so I've got these two positions here. Click next and the final thing is just to specify when you move the occupant out of the seat. Um, literature value so I'm going to move it out by 10 millimeters each time. And I'm going to click on Create Two Models. So now, Primer goes back to the original model, and it's going to create two models based on my inputs. And I'll just show you what models are created in a second. So it's just creating the second model now. Okay, so that's finished. So now in Primer, I've got three models. So I've got the original model, and then model two and model three that have been created. And as you can see, Primer's moved the occupant into um, the position above the seat and created the cables to pull the occupant into the final position. And if I flick between model two and model three, you can see the cables that are attached to the hands and arms are slightly different because that's that's because the target position for the hands and arms between the two models are slightly different. So now I can write these models out of Primer, run them in LSDyner. At the end of the LSDyner analysis, a DynerIn file will be produced, and that will be um, a keyword file which contains the final coordinate positions of the um, of the dummy and the seat. And then you can import those back into Primer, and you'll have a position dummy and a deformed seat. And the reason for doing simulation-based occupant positioning in seat squash is, um, particularly with occupant positioning, um, you don't end up then with um, all the initial penetrations that you can end up with when you're just moving an occupant around uh, within a preprocessor. Now, this is a slide showing the difference between the one stage and the two stage that I was showing before. Hopefully this comes across um, of the network. But on the left-hand side here is, is one stage, and the right-hand side is two stage. So one stage is when you're moving the occupant into the seat and positioning the arms and legs, etc., at the same time. Two stage is when you move the um, arms, legs, etc., into position, and then the whole dummy is pulled down into the seat. 
So it's a two-stage operation. So you can do set up either of these in Primer. Now, um, we've also used this exact same method um, for setting up uh, a thumbs model. So this is taking a human model, a thumbs human model, and uh, positioning it and, posi and squashing it into a seat at the same time. So you can use the same method on um, human uh, body models as well. Now, this is another script that we've included in Primer. So you can get to this by going to Tools Script. And this um, allows you to easily uh, create finger assemblies in a dummy model. So usually when you have a dummy model, um, these fingers are not in separate assemblies. So you can't move them easily relative to the hand. So the new tool in Primer allows you to quite easily create assemblies for these fingers, which then allows you to move the fingers relative to the hand and allows you to set up simulation-based um, analyses like this, where you're gripping a steering wheel. Okay, so moving on to model investigation tools. So the first thing to talk about is friction. Um, so contact friction coefficient values are important in any LS standard model. And there's now a variety of ways of setting friction coefficient values used in contact. So there's a contact card itself, the control contact card, and star, contact, uh, star uh, part contact cards, and of course, define friction cards where you can specify um, uh, friction tables. And if you have a combination of these methods, it can be difficult to understand which uh, friction coefficient values are, are used in your model and where. So there's a couple of new tools in Primer that allow you to uh, investigate these values. So first of all, you can write out friction coefficient um, information to um, an Excel spreadsheet. And within that Excel spreadsheet, it splits up all the different definitions and um, shows you pictures of the parts that are involved in those definitions. So it gives you a clear indication as to what's going on for particular contacts that you're looking at. Um, but there's also a contact friction plotting tool as well that allows you to specify um, a part in a contact and Primer will give you an exploded view um, of that part and the parts that it's going to be contact with and tell you what the coefficient of friction is between that part and, and the rest. So it gives you an image like the one shown below. Okay, moving on to the volume calculator. So this is a new tool that allows you to calculate the volume of um, uh, closed meshes. So this is useful for things like fuel tanks and it has various different tools in there. I'll show this as a demo. So here we have a fuel tank model. And if I go to volume calc and select the parts I'm interested in. So Primer is just doing some calculations now, working out um, the volume of this enclosed mesh. So here we go. This panel will update now. It tells me what the volume is. And then there's various things I can do here. So let's say I wanted to know if I fill this volume up to 75%, what would the height be? So I've typed in 75% there, clicked on calculate height, and I now get um, a, a line show me where that is. I want to know where 25% is. Calculate height it shows me that there. That's the fill level. You can also do a filling process as well. So I can specify to add the same amount of volume each time. So if I do that, this takes a few seconds to go through.
but it's adding in the same amount of volume each time, and it will give me the levels um, for each um, each time it's added in that amount of volume. So it's a filling process. Um, so now we're at 53%, so just going through that now. As I said, this just takes a few seconds to do this calculation. Nearly there now. Okay. So here we go. I'll just turn on some different colors for these lines. And you can see I'm adding in the same amount each time. And as we're getting to the wider part of this fuel tank, the obviously the fill levels are getting closer together. Um, and, and so I'll get a graphic of that. Okay. And you can do this the other way around as well. So let's say I wanted to um, look at if we wanted 50% of the height of this fuel tank. I can calculate the volume. So 50% of the height of this fuel tank, uh, the volume is 63% full. And there's various other options in here for setting a local coordinate system instead of a global coordinate system and so on. So moving on to model check <coughs> and output. So model checking continues to be an integral part of Primer. Um, there's around 500 new checks being added into version 15 compared to version 14. And so there's now around 7,200 7, individual checks in Primer. Now, one thing that we've added in is related to um, when keywords and fields on keywords uh, are supported in particular versions or not supported. So um, you'll probably know this, but when you write a model out of Primer, if a particular keyword or field on a keyword is not supported in the version of Dyna that you're running in, then you'll get a message that says that that particular field or keyword has been omitted because it won't run in that version of Dyna. So here's an example. Uh, star mat SPH viscous was added into LS Dyna R10. If you're using that in your model and you try to write that out and your output version is set to R9, like in this picture, you'll get a message that looks like this, warning, um, R9 incompatible material, mat SPH viscous, and it'll be left out. So that's all well and good, but it was slightly annoying that you only discovered this um, when you wrote the model out. So we've now incorporated this into model check. So when you do a model check now, you will get this along with the ordinary errors and warnings. Um, and you can promote them to an error rather than a warning if you want to in the in the check settings. Um, so you'll find this sort of thing early on now. If you're using a field on a keyword or using a particular keyword which is not supported in the version of Dyna that you're running in, you'll find that earlier on. I just wanted to mention this again, the output file reader. This was introduced into version 14. And what this does is that um, you can read all the text output files from LS Dyna, maybe from initialization, the D3HSP file or the OTF file, uh, the message files, log files, and so on. And Primer will scan through those files and dig out all the error and warning messages written by LS Dyna. And then from those, you can then investigate. Uh, the entities that are referenced within those errors and warnings. Um, so you'll get a tree that looks something like this, and for a particular error message, Primer knows that a particular error message relates to nodes or shells or contacts. So directly from within this tree, you can sketch or edit or do an only on those entities, and it makes it much quicker to investigate any messages that are within the... Um, um, the, the text files. Now in version 15 we've slightly expanded this so previously it just looked for errors and warning messages um, but now it also grabs these termination messages so anything anywhere where it says termination due to out of range moments or velocities or forces or something like that um, these will appear um, in this tree as well and again all the 
for this particular example here, for all the nodes that are referenced, they are all listed in the tree as well. And you can directly sketch those or do it only on them and get direct access to that, to those entities. Um, the dashboard I wanted to mention again, this again was introduced in version 14. So this is a, a dashboard for model checking and health. And it's really a way of pulling together all the various different errors and checks that you can do into one very simple panel. So this is an example. I'll go. I'll show you in Primer actually. Got an example here. This is one I run in Primer, and you get various tiles. Now you get some of these are in there by default. So this is the element quality check. This one here, this red one at the top, is a model check. So that's a normal model check, and it lists um, the errors and warnings that you have there. Dyna output check. So this is when we're reading the um, D3HSP file or log files that I just mentioned. You can get a tile in here for that. There's also a new tile in version 15 for the keyword cold check. So this is looking for keywords and fields that are not supported in the version of LS Dyna that you're running in. Now, all the rest of these tiles down here, uh, you can add as few or as many of these as you want. So behind each of these lives um, a user script. And these are really um, there to allow you to um, add in your own company-specific checks um, to the dashboard. So as an example here, we've got one that says control cards. This is something that looks to see if particular control cards are set or particular fields on control cards are set to particular values. You might have your own guidelines you want to use. So you can have a very simple script that lives behind this tile that checks that. And if you find that um, it's not following the, the rules that you have, then this can be shown as a, um, an orange or a red tile. And then um, it can be quite easily seen in this, in this dashboard. And there's lots of different things. You can do whatever you want within these scripts and return um, a message that appears on this tile. Another thing we've added into version 15 is at the top here, you've got an overall model health that can be calculated from all the results of the below tiles. And again, a script, a script lives behind that. So you've got complete control over, um, uh, over what appears in that box. So just moving on to model read write. So in version 15, model read and write is faster. Um, so parallelization and efficiency improvements mean that version 15 reads a typical model in around 60% of the time um, of version 14. And model write is also faster, around 70% of the time as in version 14. However, if your model has many, many include files, then the speed up will be greater than that. Now, on top of that, we've also added a new different formats that you can optionally use as well if you want. So there's a new binary keyword format added. Um, so the files start off in ASCII, so the tops of the files, the comments remain readable. Then after that, we have star start binary, which swaps to binary, um, and then writes the data in there. Now, why would you want to use these files? Well, <clears throat> you could think of them as kind of a primer format. Um, file. But the file size is typically 30% of the original ASCII files. And it also uh, writes to disk in around 25% of the time of the equivalent ASCII file. So it uses less um, disk space and it's quicker to read and write. So the binary format um, preserves the original formatting and can be turned back into a normal ASCII file, a normal ASCII Dyna keyword file, um, by with using Primer or using a standalone program that we will freely get out, give out as well. Now, one point is that with the undo functionality in Primer, quite often we'll have to write some information to disk and that can be a bit slow, but we have we now use the binary format for that and that is um, substantially quicker now. Now, another option you can use as well is um, is, is compression, so zipping. And essentially, we've, we've incorporated um, uh, WinZip or GZip into, into Primer. This means that Primer can now natively read um, zipped files. So if you have zipped files on your system, Primer will natively read that as well. But when you're writing a model, you can also specify that you want the files to be zipped as well. 
Um, the degree of compression is user configurable. Um, the default level gives a file size is around 25% um, of the original ASCII files. And you can, if you want to, combine the binary format and the ASCII format. So this is trying to summarize things. So just from moving from version 14 to version 15, let's say we had a typical model size of 600 megabytes. <clears throat> Previously, read in 25 seconds and writing in 45 seconds. Now in version 15, reads in 17 seconds, writes in 33 seconds. So just moving to version 15, it's quicker to read and write. But if you do want to use any of these binary or compressed formats, you do get big savings on the file size, but also the read and write time as well. So I'm just going to finish now by talking about integration with post-processing. Um, so with the OASIS tools, you would traditionally look at LSDynet input files and output files separately. But it's often desirable to access both sets of information at the same time. So for example, with output results, wanting to look at material properties of a part that has failed. Or in the input model, you might want to look at spot weld failure of a current analysis when deciding how to change your spot weld configuration. Um, so we have the ZTF file, which is a file written by Primer that allows some model information to be transferred to D3Plot to aid this. But in version 15, we've also added the ability to open one piece of software from another with the contents linked to allow you to have easy access to both sets of information. Um, so on a very basic level, it works something like this. So we already have D3Plot and THIS linked so that they can exchange information like the timeline, etc. Um, but then Primer and D3Plot is now linked, so it can exchange viewing attributes, um, cut sections, um, model data, that sort of thing. And then Primer and THIS can exchange curve information. So I'm going to demo this in a minute, but just to, it's really best uh, it works best when you've got two monitors, and this is just a, a few slides to try and explain that. So let's say you've got a Primer model. You can now click on the new Post button up here, and then Primer will automatically look in the same directory that you read the keyword file from. And if it finds results files, it will find them and tell you you can just start D3Plot. <clears throat> um, if you keep your results files in a different directory, you can navigate to that and find it as well. So when you click on the Start D3Plot button, <coughs> excuse me, D3Plot opens up. Um, and you can see now why it works best when you have multiple monitors. But then when you move the model round or blank and unblank entities within one of the programs, that will be mirrored in the other one as well. So this is just me zooming out. Um, it will be mirrored in, in the other software. So I'll try and demo this. As I said, it's a bit difficult to demo on one screen, but we will try. So let's say I've got a primer open here on the left-hand side of my screen. I click on the post button, start D3 plot. So D3 plot's opening on my other monitor here that you can't see, so I'll drag it across. And I'll also make it smaller. It's a bit difficult to demo this, but we'll try. Right, so I've got Primer on the left-hand side and T3Plot on the right-hand side. Now, if I'm in Primer and I start moving and rotating the model around, you'll hopefully see that the um, dynamic rotation translation is mirrored in D3 plot. If I blank anything in primer, then it's also mirrored in D3 plot. Now, there's various functionality that's linked up here. So if I'm primer, I can do an only on a part and do find attached, which is then mirrored across into D3 plot. I can turn on a cut section. which is mirrored across, and I can drag that back and forward. And it also works in the other way as well. So if I go across into D3 plot, and let's say I'm looking at a particular part, and it might have, 
it might be failing, it might be looking unstable. I can right click on that part and click on edit. That opens up the edit panel for that particular part in Primer and I can look at the material properties and so on. And various other options available, mass properties, opens up the mass properties for that particular part in Primer. Right click, uh, part contact is a useful one. This is the tool in Primer that for a particular part tells you all the contacts that that part is involved in. Um, so quite useful if you're looking at a part and there might be something unstable going on with the contact. Um, and also you can share data across um, between Primer and uh, THIS when you want to do some operations on some defined curve definitions as well. Um, so we've added this in and um, we've added some functionality in here. So um, please try it out. And if there's particular functionality you want in this area, please do let us know and we'll, we'll try and add that in. So that's brought me to the end of my talk. As I said, version 15 will be released very soon. So it should be with it out within the next week. So you can try these new functionalities pretty quickly. Um, please do visit our website, arab.com slash diner, for information and support. Along with the new release, we will also be launching a new website, which will contain lots more information and tutorials for you to look at. And also will include a new um, scripting community um, repository that allows you to download scripts for use within our software and also upload scripts as well, if you wish. Um, Webinars um, are ongoing, as you know. Um, all our past webinars, including this one, are recorded and uh, are available through our website. And then when you do get version 15, please do go to help and click on what's new, because that will give you a link to a document which goes through the functionality that I've been talking about today in a bit more detail. OK, that's brought me to the end of the talk. So thank you very much for listening today. I'm just going to switch and see if we've had any questions. Um, yes, we've had a few questions, so I'll just go through those now. Um, so when using mesh morphing, are you able to type in a set distance to shift the plane to the morph box? Um, yes, you can. There's, there's, a, met there's a way of um, specifying particular points that you want to move and specify the direction and then type in the distance that you want to move. So yes, you can do that. Um, can these morphing data parameterize? Um, so can it be clubbed with any optimizer to develop different designs in batch mode? Um, not currently, but we do plan on adding support for that um, so that you'll be able to parameterize um, your runs um, with, with the morphing data. So we plan on adding that in, hopefully, for version 16. Um, next question. Uh, when we use morphing, after we move the required location of the handles, will Primer help me in identifying the intersection with adjacent parts on the fly? With the help of a pop-up window that I'm aware of space available for me to work on. Um, no, it doesn't do that at the minute, um, but we could probably add that in, actually, um, in future versions. So I know what you mean. You want to avoid um, introducing initial penetrations when morphing your, your models. So um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll add that as an enhancement request. Next question. Uh, does the decomposition script just recolor the elements or can you blank them uh, by core? Um, I think we create groups at the same time. So yes, you can you can blank and unblank um, uh, those as well, as well as doing the colors. Um, and the final question, how about the intersection between these two assembly? Um, I'm not quite sure what that question relates to. So if you did type that question in, perhaps if you could um, send that question to diner.support at arab.com. Oh, dummy and seat, sorry, thank you. Um, can the morphing tool work on 3D elements? Um, yes, the morphing tool can work on 3D elements, yes. Um, how does the interaction between two... Uh, has the intersection between two well in, in primer the tool i showed is for setting up a simulation based dummy positioning and seat squash so you run it in ls diner okay so in the model you will have a contact between the dummy and the seat so as the dummy moves down into the seat the seat will deform 
So the interaction is in there, but it's handled by um, the LS Dyno analysis. If you just wanted to do it in the preprocessor, then there is a there's a simple primer seat squash method where you move the dummy into the seat and the seat just changes um, by uh, deforming the solid elements within the seat foam. Um, but the simulation-based seat squash is, is very much the norm these days and often gives much better results. Okay, that is the last of the questions. So um, again, thank you very much for attending the talk. Um, please do send any other questions or requests through to um, uh, diner.support at arab.com. And please do um, uh, visit our website when we do release version 15 and download it and use it. So again, thank you very much for attending today. Um, and goodbye.